So the interesting thing about aging is that it can affect us all differently. And this is because aging is a complex process and one part of an equation where on the other side you find these components. So environment is a major fact that um, a major factor that contributes to aging and uh, to different aging uh, patterns among individuals. So you can have nutrition, uh, environmental stressors, uh, toxins, uh, the daylight cycle, pheromones that can affect the lifespan um, or the health span of an organism. Uh, genes uh, play a role, but not such a definitive one as someone would expect. So mutations, of course, can cause diseases that can result in premature aging or early death. Uh, but in humans that appear uh, phenotypically healthy, uh, only about 25% of the variations in lifespan can be attributed to genetic factors. And even in laboratory animals, where we can greatly uh, reduce variables such as the environment, um, only 10 to 40% of lifespan variations um, have a genetic component. So the rest of the uh, percentage is attributed to stochasticity. So stochasticity is defined as randomness or noise that characterizes uh, many biological processes. In the context of aging, stochasticity is uh, quite apparent when we study genetically identical age-synchronized animals, uh, uh, which are grown and maintained under the exact same environmental conditions. So even under those terms, uh, the lifespan among individuals can vary up to 30%. And now these um, stochastic factors contribute to the individuality in the aging process, or in other words, uh, the variabilities that we see in lifespan among individuals, um, even when we have the other two components uh, unaltered within the population. So C. elegans is an ideal model uh, organism to study individuality in aging. And uh, I know uh, it won't take much to convince you about this. So here you can see a warm population of wild type individuals. Um, they're also age synchronized and they are maintained on the same plate. And in this lifespan curve, uh, you can see that the death of the first individual uh, in this population uh, at the beginning of this slope can be a week apart from the death of the last individual in this population, uh, which we all agree is uh, pretty remarkable for a species that lives an average of three weeks. Now, the concept of stochasticity in aging has been around for a few decades, but in 2010, Cynthia Kenyon introduced the idea that a stochastic event can set processes into motion that can affect the aging process. And if such an event occurs early in life and can be quantified, it can even serve as a biological marker that can predict uh, the rate of aging. So C. elegans is again a valuable model to identify and characterize such biological markers um, uh, that uh, make sense in the aging process because it shows very clear age-dependent changes. So aging worms display a decline in several aspects of their physiology from the molecular level to the cellular and uh, anatomical level. At the molecular level, there are age-associated changes in gene expression, for instance, um, in stress-responsive genes, also in quality control systems for RNA and proteins, uh, changes also in uh, fat metabolism and amino acid abundance, as revealed by um, omics studies. At the cellular level, um, organelles undergo morphological changes with age, 
while the impaired function of a couple of those, um, so the mitochondria and the ER, they even seem to promote aging or age-related pathologies. At the tissue level, we also observe age-associated deterioration, specifically in tissues such as uh, muscles, neurons, and the gonad. And this is uh, obvious when we look at the integrity of these tissues over time. So many of these age-associated changes, uh, they can provide information on the health of the animals, but they can also be indicative of the aging rates and thus can serve as uh, markers for aging research. However, most of the morphological changes um, happen um, rather late in life when aging is already underway. So a number of studies have focused on what happens at the gene expression level, where theoretically you have some fluctuations that come way ahead of the easily recognizable morphological changes. So in one of these studies, uh, Zank Pincus found that there is a substantial variability during early to mid adulthood stages in the expression of a set of regulatory microRNAs and asked whether this variability can now be used as a marker for the aging process. So he measured the expression of those microRNAs. Here I show the MIR-71 expression by promoter GFP reporter constructs from day three till day seven of adulthood. And he saw that by averaging these time points, uh, he could to a certain extent um, correlate um, this expression with the remaining of uh, the worm's lifespan. In another study, um, Tom Johnson's lab uh, showed that they could predict C. elegans uh, lifespan this time by looking at a single and even earlier time point. In this case, uh, the expression of GFP driven by the promoter of HSP 16.2, a HITSOC response gene, could predict lifespan as early as in the first day of adulthood. And what they saw was that worms that were expressing more GFP uh, upon heat shock at uh, day one, here in bright green, they live longer than worms that were expressing less GFP. But the question uh, is, can we go even earlier um, in time? Because there is proof of developmental events that can shape physiological processes later in life. Andrew Dillin, back in 2002, showed that by down regulating uh, one of the components of the respiratory chain, um, this would increase mitochondrial stress and also increase lifespan, as shown here uh, in the blue curve compared to the control one. What was interesting in this case was that you could have the exact same effect if you knock down uh, this component only during development, shown here in the red curve. So uh, such mutations, uh, respiratory chain mutations in C. elegans, have been shown to cause an increase uh, in the intracellular levels of reactive oxygen species. So we thought if uh, ROS levels are so important in early life and are able to modify lifespan, do they also have some predictive power over it? or um, are even small fluctuations such as ones not caused by mutations sufficient to define lifespan. So this is what our lab showed in the past using an in vivo sensor that uh, reports on intracellular hydrogen peroxide. So worms here shown in single dots uh, experience high H2O2 levels during development. Uh, much higher than the levels that worms encounter at later stages in life. And what was even more interesting is that we would see these high variations in H2O2 among individuals. So increased ROS have been shown to cause oxidative modifications in uh, proteins and DNA and some of which are irreversible and they can be damaging to the cell. 
but it is obvious that those elevated ROS levels during development uh, are not damaging to the worms. So what is their physiological role and why do we even have these variations? Can they imprint information that becomes relevant later in life? In other words, if aging is uh, subject to stochasticity, can these early ROS variations contribute to this stochasticity? So, um, for our latest study, we used a newer version of a redox sensor, which is based on uh, GFP, where redox sensitive cysteines have been introduced. The redox state of those cysteines can equilibrate with the redox state of the intracellular glutathione. And this GFP is also fused to glutaredoxin, which is the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction between raw GFP and glutathione. So this sensor is ratiometric. It has a bimodal spectrum uh, that corresponds to a reduced and an oxidized state, is reversible, and has been shown to serve as a proxy of the redox state of the cell. So by having this probe expressed uh, globally in worms, uh, we made similar observations as before. We saw that worms experience a highly oxidizing environment in development, which becomes reduced as worms enter into adulthood, and then it becomes oxidizing again as worms age. And every time we run this experiment, we would always find individuals as early as in the L2 stage uh, that would vary greatly from the mean. So the idea now is to collect those individuals to study them further. So this is our experimental strategy that we followed throughout the study. We started with a mixed population of worms that we age synchronized. And after two days, we end up with a population of synchronized L1s that we grow them until the L2 stage. This is the stage where we sort them and we use those sorted animals for lifespan, stress-resistant assays and transcriptomics. So we had to sort uh, between a few hundreds to a few thousands of worms per condition, per experiment, uh, in a timely manner. So the biosorter was indispensable um, for us during this process. So here you see now the distribution of a population of worms at the L2 stage uh, based on the redox state. These are about 10,000 worms. So we sorted individuals that were significantly more oxidized or more reduced from the mean. And here you see a single sorting event where we verify those sorting subpopulations in the microscope and you can see how much different these uh, two subpopulations are in terms of the redox state. So we took these two subpopulations uh, as sorted at the L2 stage and looked at their stress resistance and lifespan. And in, in, in both cases, we saw that the oxidized worms were resistant and longer lived uh, when compared to the reduced cohort. And we know that increased stress resistance has been associated with increased lifespan before. This is not something new. What was new at that time was that now these two can correlate with each other and with the intracellular um, redox states uh, in uh, developmental uh, stages. So we further showed that uh, the redox state not only correlates with stress resistance and lifespan, but it can also uh, modulate those. So by changing the redox environment during development to a more or less um, oxidizing state, then we can increase or decrease the lifespan of the individuals respectively. But what was equally exciting was that this variability in redox states appears at this point to occur randomly or stochastically. It's, uh, it is established early in life and can be measured and thus it could be used as a biological marker for the aging process. Uh, 
but briefly, just to get a little bit more into uh, the mechanism, uh, we went back to the uh, oxidized and reduced populations as sorted at the L2 stage, and we did transcriptomics to compare the gene expression at the genome-wide level. And uh, this gave us about 300 genes that were differentially regulated be the, between these two subpopulations. And we compared this list of genes with publicly available data sets. And we found that about 30% of our differentially expressed genes are associated with H3K4 trimethylation markings during uh, development. Uh, and potentially these genes are also transcriptionally regulated by this epigenetic mark. So this was exciting for us because this mark been linked to C. elegans aging before and also because the components of the complex that are responsible for the deposition of this mark and the regulation conserved among species. So here is when we further show that indeed the oxidized and reduced population are also different in their H3K4 trimethylation level. So we added to the previous pathway and established the order of events uh, because we found that uh, when H3K4 trimethylation is absent, then the endogenous redox state uh, during development can no longer affect stress resistance and lifespan. Another thing we found is that this epigenetic mark is a, a direct target of ROS, which means that we could intervene in this uh, process by adjusting or fine-tuning the redox environment exogenously. And this is one of the reasons uh, why epigenetics have drawn uh, so much attention in the aging field, uh, because epigenetics is the main mechanism by which the environment can cause long-term effects in the genome. And additionally, these modifications can be reprogrammed compared to uh, permanent genetic alterations. And therefore, interventions aimed to affect epigenetic marks may have a greater potential to affect the aging process or even treat age-associated diseases. And this brings me to the uh, ultimate question. So, uh, what have we learned so far from these studies and what would be the next steps? So, if we have identified a physiological feature that can serve as a biological marker uh, useful in the aging process, what should we draw our attention to? Uh, for instance, in, in the case of our study, we have uh, identified a very early time window during development where we encounter this um, great variability in the redox states among individuals uh, that correlate with lifespan. So, uh, is this market, uh, uh, does this market have a significant predictive power at those earlier life stages? And if so, uh, that would be great because this would leave us with a bigger time window open for interventions. So another point is that whether uh, these biological markers can report on um, other physiological processes. And in our case, we also saw that this reports to the organism stress resistance. So, and what can we learn from that? Uh, for instance, we can make some speculations on why these variations in ROS originate in the first place. Uh, so there are other studies that have suggested that these intrinsic differences in stress uh, responses, they can act as a, as a mechanism analog to bed hedging. Uh, where some individuals within a population have this benefit and they can survive um, uh, 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 stresses whenever the whole population encounters a harsher environment. Another question would be whether these biological markers can report on a physiological um, trade-off. So, uh, for instance, uh, somebody would imagine that if oxidized worms 
uh, are more stress resistant and longer live, then why not all the population is more oxidized? So there must be something that these worms are lacking, uh, potentially another defense. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a great question to address in the future. So, um, is there something else that can further enhance the predictive power of a biological marker? So, another point that comes in mind is whether the available markers now can be used in combination to uh, predict lifespan, even uh, with a higher confidence. So, Again, in our case, we have seen that the oxidized worms have a higher capacity to upregulate stress responses and survive the heat stress. Would now these oxidized animals uh, be the same animals that at the day one of adulthood, they would also give a higher HSP 16.2 upregulation signal? Or if these two mechanisms are only partially overlapping, could we still uh, use both of these uh, probes, so the redox sensor and the HS HSP 16.2 probe to identify individuals with uh, perhaps the longest lifespan within the population. Uh, another uh, interesting point is that um, biological markers are extremely useful when they can also report on the physiology of the organism over time because uh, in this way maybe we can get some insights uh, uh, on whether the, uh, the, the worms are more susceptible to uh, uh, other stressors uh, uh, as, older adult, as older individuals or whether they are at most uh, risk um, of dying from something. Uh, so this is what we tried to do here. We sorted animals uh, based on the redox state at the L2 stage, and then we just follow the redox state over time. And interestingly, we saw that worms that were initially more oxidized, now they, they are less oxidized and vice versa. So the worms that were more reduced in the, in, during development were more oxidized as worms age. So this suggests two things. First of all, that there is some type of information being imprinted at this stage because these pseudosubpopulations, they start off as being different, then they converge as they enter into adulthood and then they become distinct again, but in the opposite direction. So another question that comes up is that, is the reason why worms uh, that are initially more oxidized live longer uh, so, can the reason be that now they experience lower ROS levels as they age? And so does that mean now that ROS level, ROS levels become damaging with age? And also, is this another time window that we could potentially intervene to affect lifespan? So similarly to the individuality in lifespan in uh, healthy aging individuals, uh, uh, a, valid a valid question would be whether there is individuality in the susceptibility to diseases. And this is a great study where they use the predictive power of the HSP 16.2 GFP reporter and now, instead of lifespan, they used the heat shock induced expression of this probe to look at inter individual variability and uh, how this would affect the outcome of introduced mutations that show a phenotype later in life. And what they saw was that worms that had lower levels of HSP 16.2 induction were more affected by the LIN31 mutation that induces uh, the formation of this ectopic valve now in adults. So along those lines, uh, something for instance that could be tested with our system is the effect of the differential redox states during development in the context of age-related neurodegenerative uh, pathologies. 
So we could express these sensors in C. elegans models of these diseases. And I show here an example of a C. elegans Parkinson's model, which expresses the human alpha synuclein, which forms uh, those uh, age dependent inclusions indicative of amyloid deposition. So if we sort again based on redox states, uh, would we now see uh, the patterns of these inclusions being different between oxidized and reduced worms? And this could be another great use of the worm sorter, because we, in this way we could also assess the, the redox state and also the fluorescent patterns of these uh, worms. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, if we have gathered now all this information from early life biological uh, markers um, for the aging process, how can we use this to improve the physiology of the organisms during uh, aging? And in worms, um, we and others have seen that early life interventions, uh, in our case, for instance, by oxidants or antioxidants uh, uh, early development. Uh, so in this way we can change the course of lifespan. So are these early life interventions something feasible uh, in mammals? And the answer is partially yes. Uh, what we know already is that uh, developmentally early and transient metabolic events uh, they also have uh, an impact in mammalian lifespan, but uh, more studies are needed. Uh, in mice, for instance, it has been shown that a reduction in food intake for the first three weeks of life uh, is sufficient to extend their lifespan uh, by about 15%. And of course, in mammals, we don't have the sample power to study individuality in a homogeneous population, but we can get many insights from long-lived and short-lived uh, mouse strains or species. Uh, a, a transient six-week uh, course uh, of growth hormone treatment right after birth uh, in mice, for instance, was sufficient to abrogate the lifespan extension in long-lived mice. And there is uh, an intriguing line of uh, aging uh, research that demonstrates that fibroblasts isolated from long-lived mice and also other species are more um, heat and oxidative stress resistant when compared to fibroblasts from short-lived uh, species. Another comparative study has shown that uh, those, uh, long, uh, those fibroblasts from long-lived uh, uh, species had different uh, transcriptional profiles, for instance, in genes in uh, DNA repair and glucose metabolism, and also uh, different metabolic profiles in amino acids, again, between long-lived and short-lived species. So can any of these features now serve as a biological marker in a wild-type population? Or do these long-lived and short-lived species has also, have also a different intracellular redox environment or redox proteomics profile during development? So these are all very interesting questions for future studies. So, uh, but again, in humans, uh, things are uh, more complex and there's probably a thousand reasons why individuals that um, biologically and chronologically look very similar at younger ages, they end up having um, uh, so different aging paths. And we cannot really monitor uh, individuality uh, because everybody intrinsically is so different and also the conditions that everyone is exposed to are different. But what we could uh, do is um, use uh, ident use uh, 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 biological markers or identify new biological markers that would be observable throughout uh, the human um, uh, throughout the human aging process and that would predict uh, to some extent some functional capacity better than the chronological uh, age or even the susceptibility to age-related diseases and these again would be stochastic factors that may have been missed um, uh, even in model organisms, because we are looking um, either exclusively on aged animals, 
or, or we're not looking at what happens at earlier life stages or because most of the studies with model organism, they rely on population averages uh, where the individual is not at the center of the stage. So these factors can um, still be indicators of such individuality and have a significant impact in human aging and health. So uh, uh, this is what I, I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, I hope you uh, found some interesting things that uh, might be relevant to your own research and I would be happy to take uh, questions.